Hi everyone, I'm Johan. I'm a maintainer of various open source projects, including the gRPC Gateway and Improbable's gRPC Web. I've contributed to Go, and I run a blog writing mainly about Go and gRPC. This is my first gRPC conf, and it's great to be part of it. I work at Buff, where we are working on API management tooling for Protobuf users through schema-driven development. We already support linting of protofiles and breaking change detection, and we've got some really exciting products in the works, including the Buff schema registry and automated protobuf file generation and dependency management. Check out our website for more information. Let's dive into the talk. Today, we're going to look at what we mean by HTTP JSON, what it's used for, and explore some problems associated with it. We're then going to learn about how we can get the best of both worlds, but best of both gRPC and HTTP slash JSON with the gRPC gateway. We'll then have some demo, live demo of it in action. What do we mean when we say HTTP slash JSON? We mean a RESTful interface making use of the HTTP verbs get, post, put, patch, delete, and using JSON as the payload content type. This is the de facto standard for most public APIs today. Sometimes it's not entirely RESTful, but it's almost always using JSON. It's easy for humans to read and write. It's got native JavaScript support. All is well, right? Is everything well? As anyone who's ever had to quickly push a configuration fix to your JSON configured service knows, trailing commas are forbidden in JSON. I wish I was joking in saying that this is a big problem, but entirely new formats have been developed to deal with this problem. There's also no support for comments. It's unnecessarily verbose on the wire, but compression can help mitigate this. In large deployments, the marshalling and unmarshalling of JSON is a constant strain on response latency. Most importantly, it's not well typed enough, and there's no single way to define the interface types. OpenAPI is an option, but it's not globally adopted. Most of these problems stem from the fact that JSON was designed to be human readable, but also effective for a machine to use. These two properties are, unfortunately, incompatible. Protocol buffers and gRPC provides all the benefits we care about over HTTP slash JSON, such as speed, type safety, a single source of truth, code generation, and much more. We know this, which is why we're using gRPC. But why hasn't the whole world switched to protobuf and gRPC? Unfortunately, it's not always so easy to switch entire application stacks to new frameworks. Often, there are a number of reasons why we keep using old standards when new, better alternatives are available, such as compatibility with existing systems, management pressure, and, in this case, the still prevalent expectation that a public API should be using HTTP slash JSON. What can we do when we want to use gRPC but are forced to use HTTP slash JSON? The gRPC Gateway project allows you to design gRPC and HTTP JSON services at the same time. It uses a custom protobuf generator that generates a simple reverse proxy that translates on the fly from JSON to protobuf and back again. It allows you to define a URL path and HTTP verb to gRPC service method mapping with a simple annotation scheme in the protofiles, as you can see here. It also provides a Swagger slash open API generator in which, in case you have some generator, in case you have some generator you want to use that requires the open API format. I've added the HTTP JSON annotations to the previously defined service methods above. As you can see, the HTTP verb and URL path mappings are defined within the RPC definitions. So how does it work? This image shows the basic building blocks of the gateway. You generate the gRPC service as usual with product gen go or product c, and then you use our custom generator product gen gRPC gateway to generate a gateway handler file which registers the mapped HTTP verbs and URL paths to a central mux, which is then used to serve the external HTTP slash JSON interface. It's common to serve the gRPC gateway and the gRPC server on different ports of the same server to allow both HTTP JSON clients and gRPC clients, but this is not mandatory. The gateway can also be used with non-Go gRPC services, 
you simply connect to an external gRPC service in the setup. You can even serve the gateway and gRPC server on the same port and split traffic using HTTP headers if you want to get fancy. OK, now we're going to go into a little bit of a live demo of the gRPC gateway in action. And you'll get a few seconds here to copy down the URL for my open source boilerplate repo. And then I'm going to switch to the repo, and we're going to do some uh, live coding together. OK, let me change the presentation. <clears throat> OK, now we've switched to the boilerplate repo. And the first thing we're going to look at is the protofile. So you're all probably familiar with how protofiles look. So this is not going to be strange. And as you can see, we've just got some a package declaration, a syntax declaration, and uh, some imports. We're then defining the Go package, which is uh, naturally part of using a Go gRPC server. Uh, then we've got some extra annotations here, which are used for generating the OpenAPI, aka Swagger file that comes together with the REST API. So if we continue down the file here, we've got a normal service de uh, definition. As anyone who's familiar with Protobuf and gRPC will know, this is the, what maps to a gRPC service. And then we, it gets a little bit interesting here, because under the add user, we can see that we've got some extra annotations here. And as you can see here, we can declare that we want to map a certain URL path to the add user gRPC service uh, method. So we say that a post request to the API v1 users uh, URL path should map to the add user request on the gRPC service. So this is how we say. Uh, how we do the mapping between GFC path, uh, HTTP paths and uh, GFC backend. And we can also declare that we want the entire JSON body to map to the add user request. So this simply says that the add user request JSON representation is what we expect to be provided on the uh, HTTP URL. And then we've got some more open API annotations here just to make the Swagger file look a little bit nicer. And then we've got another user here, uh, another method here called list users, which in the same fashion contains a URL mapping, in this case, to a get verb uh, on API v1 users. And this is, of course, the standard path for something that will list users. So that makes sense to map to the list users method. And again, we've got some open API mappings down here, uh, annotations down here to add some extra tags and stuff. And then we've got the message definitions. And as you can see, there's nothing particularly interesting about these. In fact, there's it's, it's a very minimal interface. And then if we dive quickly into the main Go file, if you're not familiar with Go, this is going to be a little bit unfamiliar. But just giving you an overview of what's happening here, we start a, uh, HTTP, oh, a TCP listener on port 10,000 on the local net network. We then start serving a Go gRPC server with uh, our own in, um, certificates here. You would obviously replace these with your own certificates when uh, you're working on your own server. And then we register the generated server to the gRPC server. And then we serve that in a Go routine. And then here, if we jump into the gateway package, this is where it gets a little bit interesting, because he, this is the gRPC gateway setup. So this is where we perform a gRPC client connection dial to the gRPC server that we just started. And as you can see, uh, we've got the dial adder on, on the um, function as a functional parameter, setting up the gRPC logger. And uh, we're using the same transport credentials that we were using when we created the server. So we're using TLS between the gRPC gateway, gRPC client, and the gRPC server. Uh, and then we use this method that was generated by our product gen gRPC gateway generator to register the uh, server handler to this gRPC client connection, which means that now the gRPC server, uh, the gRPC gateway server can map all of the HTTP methods properly down to the gRPC client that we declared up here. 
So if you're using a Java server or a C++ server, again, this part, uh, you can do exactly the same because you're just doing a GRPC client connection dialing here. So you just need to use a, a, a different dial address. And then we're serving the HTTP, uh, the, the GRPC gateway MUX, but we're also adding a little bit extra flair in this example, which is that we want to serve the generated open API UI together with it. Uh, so on port 11,000, we serve both the GRPC gateway and the open API handler. And enough theory, let's, let's just take a quick look at what that looks like. So if I do that, I'm going to open my browser. OK, so here you go. We, I've loaded the uh, OpenAPI server on my in my browser. The first thing we notice is that we get a security warning, of course, because we are using a self-signed uh, certificate in this case. Uh, because I'm serving this on localhost, I'm going to go ahead and accept the risk and continue, because I am hopefully not being intercepted on the way from my computer to my computer. And as you can see, here we have the OpenAPI UI that's been generated from, I'm going to enlarge this a little bit. It's been generated together with the uh, definitions that we had in the uh, profile. So as you can see, this completely maps to uh, the URL paths that we had listed in the profile. And this, this totally works as well. You can list users. Obviously, now this actually gave a content length of zero response because we have no users. But if we go ahead and add a user now, uh, this doesn't take your parameters. So I'm just going to send it an empty uh, JSON document. That's response with, uh, OK, we got an ID of a user here. Thank you. We added a user. And if we execute this, then you can see now we get back um, <clears throat> a user. So this is uh, interactive. You can use this for testing. You can even use it for uh, as, a, as a product in, in front of uh, your own API or something like that. But let's uh, take another step back and see what happens if we want to make some changes to the code and just how quickly we can uh, iterate on the code and regenerate everything and everything just works. You know, the, the kind of powerful uh, development workflow that we're used to with part of F. So I'm going to switch back to my boilerplate repo. I'm going to turn off the server. Now, let's say we want to add a parameter to the user. Let's call, say we want the user to have a name. See, this is what we do here. We'll then need to add a user, um, a name to the user add user request. String name. There we go. And then this is all we need. And we can run make generate, which is. Um, created makefile command that will run protoc with all of the generators that we have uh, here and just recreate everything for us. Now, if we run go run main go again and jump back to the browser window, let's just make sure that we're disabling the cache when we reload the window because we're downloading a new Swagger file. Now, if we want to add a user, all of a sudden, we have a name parameter here. So let's do that. And you can see the curl request that was made here. We forgot to update the, uh, the back end. Let's jump back quickly to the application. Update the backend server. OK. so. Here we have the go backend server, which is implementing all this. We'll take the request. And now that we've regenerated this, we have a name here. So let's do record name when we're adding the user. And as you can see here, this is a, just a mutex protected uh, uh, array that's being stored in memory. And uh, list users just reads back from that array. So now we've updated the server as well. Run that. And let's jump back to the browser window. We don't even have to reload this page, I think. If I try and execute it now, yes, OK, we got the name back. And if we try to do uh, list users here, 
yes, we got that user back and uh, the name has been stored. So as you can see, this the powerful protobuf uh, workflow that we're used to, where we just change the protobuf files and regenerate and everything just works, is completely unlocked by the grpc gateway as well. You just have to use the protobuf file as usual, regenerate it, and your REST API is updated automatically, including the documentation, as you can see. So let's jump back into the presentation. OK. So let's talk a little bit more about specific protobuf features that are supported by the gRPC gateway. We start by the rich type support for the, the protobuf well-known types. These types are part of what you might call a protobuf standard library, and they're always included with a proto-c compiler, meaning that you don't have to manually manage their downloading and generation. They use a special namespace, google.protobuf, which makes them easy to recognize. These types are predefined messages and include messages for handling time steps, durations, wrappers of primitive types, and others. All of these types have special cases built into them for the gateway. So whenever, for example, you need a timestamp, make use of the well-known type. As you can see, I've added some examples here. The timestamp time marshals to and from an RFC 3339 timestamp string. The uint32 value can be used to have nullable uint32s, and the struct type can be used to store arbitrary JSON structures. Please use the last one carefully, as the protobuf representation is a mess to work with and should only be a last resort. There's another well-known type that has good support in the gRPC gateway. Most protobuf primitive fields, such as strings and integers, are non-nullable. So in order to do partial updates, the best practice is the use of a special message type called a field mask. Exposing this implementation detail to your users, however, is pretty nasty. So the gRPC gateway supports translating JSON fields to a field mask and resource type. Fields that are found in the input JSON are used to populate the resource and field mask automatically. This code shows an example structure with the service omitted. The output only comment indicates that the field is not mutable via partial updates, which is in line with the Google API design docs recommendations. This support was entirely the result of an open source contribution from Roman Azami and Daniel McDonald. When working with gRPC, we use the status type for errors, which includes a message and a code. The gRPC gateway automatically translates the codes into appropriate HTTP status codes, according to the google.rpc.code definitions. Here we can see a sample of the error codes and their respective mappings. If you have more specific needs for your error handling, such as a custom error struct format, you can create your own error handling function and configure the runtime max with it on startup. Here we have an example of an error handler that sets the response code to one that is mapped from the gRPC status and the response body to simply be the error message itself. Note that using custom errors like this will break the default OpenAPI generator definitions. And wrapping it all up, what have we done today? We've created a HTTP slash JSON service, but used gRPC and protobuf under the hood. This allows us to get all the benefits of the protobuf IDL while still exposing a JSON interface externally. We've also managed to sneak a gRPC service into our stack, and now it's much easier to argue that gRPC might be something worth trying. New clients can use gRPC, and old clients can keep using the JSON interface. Most importantly, we found an easy, robust way to write RESTful services, and we've only explored a snapshot of all that the gRPC gateway has to offer. Other features include the ability to set cookies, perform header-based authentication in interceptors, and much more. I hope you will as I do, use the gRPC gateway for your next HTTP slash JSON service. Thank you.